special reminders for everyone. We are including two songs in our Wednesday evening service. Um, and Matthew Brett will be leading that first song in just a moment. After that song, um, Les Clark will be leading us in prayer. And then Blake Edwards will be rejoining us for uh, tonight's part of our series. Um, some of you have met Blake a number of times before. For some of you also, maybe the first time, I encourage you after the assembly to spend some time with him. Um, you know, the West family thinks a lot of him, and so uh, that's a good plus in his court. Uh, he suffered and endured an entire week with uh, Terry Francis recently, and so if you know Terry, that's like a badge of honor that you should really recognize that he's been through it a little bit and probably needs a couple hugs and some encouragement. Um, but we're glad to have him here tonight. We're glad to be able to continue in our series of studies as we look at the Minor Prophets. Um, the Minor Prophets is a series of messages, the Twelve, sometimes kind of get clumped together. There's two reasons that happens. One, structurally, because that's how they're presented for us in the um, typical layout of the Hebrew Bible. They're all put together in that uh, small segment there. But also because they seemingly cover much of the same kind of thing. The messages tend to blend together when we don't pause and reflect. The, the expectation of salvation kind of ebbs and flows based on the context of the setting of the delivery of those messages. But I want to encourage each of you as you're reading through the Minor Prophets each week and even tonight as we um, work through this message together, that you remember that these messages serve at least two purposes. The, per the primary purpose was the recipients, those that would hear it in the first person, first day opportunity. It would encourage them, admonish them, and strengthen them. But the secondary purpose is fulfilled in Jesus, and our faith in Christ is the extension of that fulfillment. And so when we read through them, look for Jesus, look for spiritual solutions, and look for the admonitions that are universal to all. And so when God talks about justice and judgment and redemption, he's not talking to those initial recipients alone, he's talking to all of us. So this time I'm going to turn our assembly over to Matthew, and he's going to lead us in song, and then uh, Les will be leading us in prayer. Seven ninety seven. Seven nine seven. Lord, we come before thee now. Seven nine seven. <coughs> Lord, we come before thee.
Heavenly Father, we're so thankful we can come together this evening in the middle of our week and sing songs of praise to you and hymns to you. We are thankful for this opportunity that we have to look into your word and hear a lesson from it and see ways that we can get things out of the lesson that will help us in our lives today. We thank you, Father, for your Son and our blessed Savior and the sacrifice that he made that we have an opportunity to be with you through eternity. We thank you, Father, for all the material blessings that you greatly bless us with. You're so abundant to us, and, and we're thankful. We know that all these things come from you, sometimes the things that uh, maybe we take for granted too much, but we know they come from your blessings. Father, we pray that you'll be with each of us as we go through our daily lives, that we'll be the example that we should be to everyone we come in contact with, that they can see your son living in our lives. We pray, Father, that you'll be with our brother Blake this evening as he presents this uh, message to us. And pray that he will say things in a clear way that we can understand and be able to make application to our lives today. We pray, Father, that you'll be with those of our number that are, <clears throat> that are having health problems. You'll bless them with better health. Be your will. We thank you so much for those that we've been praying for that have improved and continue to prove, improve. Pray that you'll continue to be with them. Uh, we pray, Father, that you'll be with our country, the turmoil that is in, the things that are evil are being called good, and things good are being called evil. Things that we know that are an abomination to you and also an abomination to us. That, uh, things trying to be forced on us. Pray, Father, that you'd help us all to be strong and continue to look to you for guidance. Pray that it be your will that things will change in our country and that things continue the way they are. Whatever we pray that you'll help us to have the faith and strength to continue on in our love for you, knowing that in the end you will take care of us. Pray that you'll forgive us of our sins as we repent of them. We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. In Christ's name, amen. Well, it's good to be back with you all. I, I went on your website to see the last time that I was here, and unless there was a recording that got taken down for some reason, which that's always possible, because... Uh, I don't know, you know, things happen. Um, but I think I was here four years ago, so obviously a lot's changed, and a lot even a year ago, or a year and a half ago has changed, and so um, I really am grateful to be back. The, the group looks somewhat similar from what I remember. I, I always have appreciated just your kindness uh, whenever I have been here. I think I visited another time or two. Uh, I know the West pretty well because I know their daughter, and I know th they're uh, one of their nephews uh, really well. So I've, I've visited in, in times past because of that as well. And so I'm just very thankful for this group. Um, I said this to, to Philip in uh, the message when he asked if I would come speak that I, I know that this might, this might sound like I'm a little bit of a creeper or something like that, um, but uh, I'm not, I don't think so. Um, but I really appreciate this group and your dedication to a couple of things. Like, I've noticed over the last year and a half that you guys have done everything you can that's within your power to be together as often as you can, just as safe as you can as well. Like, I just noticed that from afar. I noticed that just from Facebook Live and things like that. I was like, they're, they're, they're doing everything that maybe they can. And I think that's, that's really impressive, and I appreciate that. Um, it takes a lot to field all the different perspectives and still try to be true to the Lord and also true to each other. And, I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of everything at any other group other than where I am. But uh, from, from afar, I really appreciate this group and, and what you all have been doing. So, anyway, um, we're going to be in Zephaniah. And if you struggle to find Zephaniah, you're not alone, because uh, that, that is usually me. Whenever I'm flipping through trying to find any of the minor prophets, I just do the whole thing where you, start, you just start flipping, you know, start scanning, and then you're like, okay, I don't see it, so... I'll act like I'm thinking of something else when really I'm just like trying to make sure everyone doesn't look at me while I actually have to go to the table of contents. But if you are struggling to find it, if you do go to Matthew 
and you just start kind of flipping. You'll see Malachi, you'll see Zechariah, eventually you'll see Zephaniah. Zephaniah is three chapters. I did not know a whole lot about Zephaniah, not that I could recall at least, until I started studying for this. So this has been really helpful to me. And some of the things that we're going to look at tonight, I, I really hope are going to be helpful for you all, because they've been helpful for me to look at. We're not going to read the whole thing, uh, depending on how time goes, but I don't, I don't think we'll have time to read the whole thing and talk about all the things in detail. And there are going to be a couple points throughout the, the, our time where I do want to open it up and I do have a few questions that, that I think we can talk through. So obviously you all know, because this is your series that you've been going through, that it's not just studying the, the book or, or studying these prophets and what they have to say or what God says through these prophets. Specifically, we're trying to find the moral issues, the moral struggles, and, and what the prophets were dealing with with either the people of God or the surrounding nations. So obviously God is going to punish sinful things. What the prophets are trying to accomplish, or maybe a better way of thinking about it, is what God is trying to accomplish through the prophets is either to just warn them that this is going to happen, or to send a message to try to get them to repent and turn away from those things before it happens. Zephaniah is a little interesting because I didn't see anywhere where they're actually told to repent, although I think it's implied. They are told that this is going to happen, that destruction is coming, punishment is coming, and it's not just on God's people. This is actually one of the ones that talks about Judah or Jerusalem, which is God's people, and it's also talking about other nations. So chapter, I'll just break it down, I guess, quickly. Chapter 1, you're going to have God's message to his people in chapter 1. Chapter 2, for the most part, is chapter 2. And some of chapter 3, it's going to be God's message to the surrounding nations. And then towards the end of that section, the, beginning, the first eight verses of chapter 3, is also he's coming back to Judah and talking to them. Then the, the rest of chapter 3 is going to be where the hope is. There's still hope, even though... Punishment and judgment is coming, and it's coming for several reasons, and we're going to look at that. But what I want to do is I actually want to just, I'm going to have this on the screen so you don't have to turn there, but if you do want to turn to 2 Kings 21, oh, sorry, I'm a little bit behind there. Um, 2 Kings 21 gives us a little bit of backdrop because you see Zephaniah, we don't know the exact year that he prophesied, or even, it's not really even a short time frame that we know of. It could be anywhere from 640 B.C. to 620 B.C., or excuse me, 640 to uh, 612 B.C. And the reason we know that is because it says in verse 1 of Zephaniah 1 that he was prophesying in the days of Josiah. So okay, that gives us that one marker, somewhere around 640 or so, 641 maybe. But then in chapter 2 it mentions that Nineveh is going to fall, and that God is going to make Nineveh a desolation in chapter 2, verse 13. So we have those two markers Besides that, we don't have any clear markers, but we do have some signs of things. So if it's in the days of Josiah, and if it's going to be in a time where, where Judah is still really corrupt, because some of the things we're going to talk about, like idolatry and such, then maybe it's before Josiah's reforms. So maybe we're looking at a more condensed time frame. Maybe it's something like, you know, 635 to 625 or something like that. We just don't know, though. Um, it could have been that it was after Josiah had started making some reforms, but it was like in the middle of those reforms. And again, we just don't know. I think the important thing to, to notice, though, is the status of Judah before Josiah becomes king. So that's why I wanted us to just look quickly at 2 Kings chapter 21. You have Manasseh that's mentioned here in verse 16. And if you want to turn back there, you can see some of the other things about Manasseh. I mean, he's just an awful king for Judah. But then you have, also have a son, Ammon. So it says in 2 Kings 21, Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, besides the sin that he made Judah to sin, so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then it skips down, and it actually talks about his son, Ammon, that becomes king. And it says that Ammon was 22 years old when he began to reign. He reigned two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Meshulameth, the daughter of Haruz of Jotha. And I guess, I mean, I, didn't, I don't know how to say those names. So that, that, I know sometimes we pause, like just, just fake it, you know, you'll be all right. Um, I'm probably going to do that when we read some in Zephaniah. 
And then he says that, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh's father had done. So he follows in Manasseh's footsteps, his father. And it says that he walked in all the way in which his father walked, served the idols that his father served and worshipped them. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, did not walk in the way of the Lord. And the servants of Ammon conspired against him and put the king to death in his house. But the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against King Ammon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his place. Now the rest of the acts of Ammon, all that he did, they're written in the book of Chronicles. So what I want to notice is all that it says that he did. First of all, he walked, in, he walked not in the way of the Lord. He walked in the ways of Manasseh. He walked in evil ways, and he did evil things. But it actually says that he abandoned the Lord. So that's the, the king, that's the ruler, the person that is really leading the people of God. He abandoned God. Well, what do you think the people are going to do? Well, they've abandoned God for the most part as well. Unless I'm reading this wrong, one thing that I do notice is that it says that the servants conspired and put him to death. Well, that's obviously evil. But it actually was a good thing because he's an evil king. But then notice what happens among the nation. It says that the people of the land struck down all those who had conspired against the king. So here's two options. Either they, they knew it was just wrong that the king was killed, so they decided, we have to kill these people that killed our king. Or the people of God were so supportive of this evil king that they chased after his servants that killed him because that's how devoted they were to evil. No matter, how, no matter which way it is, it shows the corruption within the nation. This is God's people. Now, Israel has already been taken captive. I think you all probably have studied that with the other minor prophets. They've been taken captive. Now we know that Judah is going to be next. And we know that Assyria is in power, but they're, they're about to uh, fall back. They're about to be diminished. We know that Babylon is going to rise. So what God is trying to do is, in the midst of all this horrible stuff, there's this King Josiah. He has all these reforms, but the people of God need to be ready. And they need a message from God so that they will wake up, that they will get rid of this evil stuff, stop being like the nations around them, and get ready for the captivity that is coming. Not that they will escape the captivity, but that they will still have hope in spite of the captivity, that they will keep doing what's right, even when it's difficult. And I think that's why this message from Zephaniah resonates with us today. So another thing that we do know is that it does say that the day of the Lord is coming. It's actually mentioned at least 13 times in this text, but if you want to broaden it out and see how often it says it, I don't even know if you could count how often this day of the Lord is referenced. So if you just look in chapter 1 alone, it's mentioned uh, several times. So for instance, in chapter 1, we'll start in verse 4. God says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off from this place the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Malcolm, those who have turned back from following the Lord who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. So that's what's going on. And then if you go down a little farther, it says in verse 10, on that day, this is the day of the Lord, declares the Lord, a cry will be heard from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, a loud crash from the hills. Wail, O inhabitants of mortar, for all the traitors are no more. All who weigh out silver are cut off. At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are complacent. Those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. Their goods shall be plundered, their houses laid waste, though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hasting fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet blast and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the lofty battlements. I will bring distress on mankind so that they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. On the day of the wrath of the Lord, in the fire of his jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed. For a full and sudden end, he will make all the inhabitants of the earth. So, I don't think that God is talking about the end times here. I think he is talking about in their world, in their context, 
everything is going to be destroyed. Like, I mean, I think he's just, he's talking about just the impending doom, and it's going to be an utter doom. If you actually go back to the first couple verses of chapter 1, it actually says in verse 2 that he's going to utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth. I think he's saying that in their world, in Judah, and even in the nations around, which chapter 2 talks about, everything is going to be destroyed. It's going to be laid waste. There's going to be nothing left. Again, there's nothing left, but then there's going to be hope. But now is not the time for hope. Now is the time for the desolation and the, and the punishment and all, all the doom and gloom. So this day of the Lord is a theme within Zephaniah. Again, at least it's mentioned 13 times, if not referenced many other times. Unlike other prophets, Zephaniah doesn't record that many pleas for them to repent, but it's a clear message that they need to turn back to God. The day of the Lord is fixed. There's no changing it. It's going to happen. The day of the Lord is intentional. It is to punish the evil. There's nothing that they will be able to do to stop it, but they can still respond before that day comes, and God will recognize that, and there will be this remnant. There will be hope for those people. So what I want to do is, I, you're not going to be able to read all of this, but I'm going to have all the, yeah, there's no way you're going to be able to read all of that. I'm going to have the text up here, and I don't want to read everything. We just read a lot of the verses, but I do want to read some things, and I want to just point out some things as we go. So we're going to start in chapter 1. We've already read some of the verses, but let's just back up a little bit, and let's start in verse 2, and we'll read 2 and 3, and then we're going to skip down to verse 7, because we didn't read that. So beginning in chapter 1, verse 2, God says, I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away man and beast. I will sweep away the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea and the rubble of the wicked. I will cut off mankind from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. What does that sound like? Like everything is going to be taken. There's going to be no man. There's going to be no beast. There's going to be no fish. Even the rubble, even like the, the, the stuff that the wicked people, everything is going to be gone. All things that are good and all things that are evil are going to be wiped away, is what he's saying. The reason I think that God paints that picture of just utter desolation and emptiness is I think that he wants them to understand that they have abandoned him to the point that there's no sign of God in the land. There's no sign of God in Judah because it's so evil. So if God is not there, what, is, what does his creation look like? It's nothing, right? This should... Think this should bring our mind back to before God ever created anything. It was empty. There was nothing. Because of their sin, God's going to bring it to nothing. So then you go to verse 7. This is where he gives some instructions for what they should, how they should respond to what he's going to do. He says, Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guest. And on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all who array themselves in foreign attire. On that day, I will punish everyone who leaps over the threshold and those who fill their master's house with violence and fraud. So what, what God wants to do is he wants to gather together all the people and he wants them to seek him before this day comes. And the problem, though, is that they are so evil. They have so much idolatry. They have so much corruption within them. I, I want to talk in a second about uh, more of their problems, but let's go ahead and go to chapter 2, and I want to read the next section. So if you go to chapter 2, and really I think the next section picks up in verse 4. So chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, really seems like that's all to, uh, all to Judah. Beginning of verse 4, he says, For Gaza shall be deserted, and Ashkelon shall become a desolation. Ashdod's people shall be driven out, of, uh, out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. When you see names like Ashkelon and Ashdod, just think of the Philistines. I mean, that, that's what I think of at least. Um, Philip said he's going over to Israel, uh, I guess it's uh, next year sometime maybe. Um, I remember when I went in 2014, uh, I remember hearing about some things going on that were reason we should be concerned. And actually, it was right before some stuff happened where there were some missiles that were sent into Israel. We, like, left the day before that happened. But I remember we were in, I think it was Ashkelon, right there on the coast. And I remember them saying, they were like, this is a city or, you know, this is, yeah, this is a city that has seen so much battle and destruction over the years. I mean, like, it is like the middle ground between Israel and Gaza. And so it's just seen so much destruction. Well, God actually points out that city here. 
And he says that that is a place that's going to be deserted. It's going to become a desolation. And then he pronounces woes on some people in verse 5. And then if we skip down just a little bit, and we see verse 8, we're going to see some other people that God's talking to that sound familiar. He said, I've heard the taunts of Moab, the revilings of the Ammonites, how they've taunted my people, made boast against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Ammonites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by nettles and salt pits and a waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. So these other people, the Moabites, the Ammonites, they're going to be destroyed. They're going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think where he says that it's going to be filled with nettles and salt pits, and it's going to be a waste forever. There's going to be no signs of life there. Like, forever is what God is saying. He's saying he's going to utterly destroy them. So he's saying that he's going to punish them. He's going to punish the Philistines. And then he says in verse 13 that he's going to stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. Imagine the most, uh, the, just the biggest nation that's been taking everybody over. They just took over Israel, you know. I mean, not in real life, I'm saying if you're in Judah, you know. They just took over Israel, you know, less than 100 years before this time. And now here's God saying, I'm going to destroy them. I'm going to destroy that nation. I, I wouldn't even know what was next. I, I would think, oh, so we're going to be free. Well, no, there's actually another nation that's going to come up. Babylon's going to come up. But God is saying he's going to utterly destroy them. Then in chapter 3, he gets back to Judah. And he actually says in chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no corruption, no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions, and her judges are evening wolves that leave nothing till the morning. Her prophets are fickle, treacherous men. Her priests profane what is holy. They do violence to the law. The Lord within her is righteous. He does no injustice. Every morning he shows forth his justice. Each dawn he does not fail, but the unjust knows no shame. So here's God turning back to Judah and saying, they are part of these people that are going to be, cor- that are going to be destroyed because they're so corrupt. They don't trust God. They don't draw near to God. That doesn't change who God is. Even though his priests and his prophets are awful, they're taking advantage of people, they're cheating their own people, the Lord is still righteous. He doesn't do any injustice. So he's going to destroy these people. There just seems to be no hope. But I think when you go to verse 8, you start seeing a little bit of hope. He says in verse 8 of chapter 3, Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey, for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger, for in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. Then he says, For at that time I will change the speech of the people to a pure speech. How can God say that in the midst of all this destruction, this punishment for sin, that he is somehow going to change something that is impure, that is defiled to be pure. I think that what we see here is we see a glimmer of hope. That as he is saying, wait for me, wait for my destruction, there's going to be something that happens after this destruction that actually is very encouraging that gives the people hope, that should give us hope as well. So a few things that we can just focus on uh, also from, uh, I forgot to uh, advance the slide, but from chapter 3, is we see that God has purpose to purify people and to cleanse them. That God wants to unify people. If you you go down a little bit and you see in verse... um, Verse 11, for instance, 11 through 13, he, he mentions that. But then you go down to, to verse 16, where he says, On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. For the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of, who, those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with, your, with all of your oppressors. I will save the lame, gather the outcast. I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time I will bring you in. At the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. 
when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So what is God going to do one day to these people? He's going to gather his people that are faithful. There's going to be a faithful remnant that will be left, and he, he's going to restore them. They're going to be able to praise him. They're going to be able to sing to him and worship him. Even though they've been so defiled and so wicked, he is going to purify them and cleanse them. And he's going to gather them together. I mean, we should just think in our minds of like, it's going to be a huge church service that they finally are going to be able to have after getting all the wickedness out. And God is saying that he's going to allow them to worship him. And he's going to protect them. He's going to look over them. And he's going to actually bless them and restore them. God is going to celebrate and rejoice as he gathers the humble, the lowly, the lame, and the outcast. So that's Zephaniah. It's awful. It's awful. It's awful. Maybe it, maybe it could be okay. Then one day it will be great. And I don't know how, if you, if you all think of it this way, but I wonder if we should actually be seeing our lives a little bit more like that. I just don't feel like things are awful. <laughs> I just don't feel like everything is meant for destruction around me. But it is. It truly is. The, the difference is that God calls us to be part of the faithful now and to look forward to and, and hope in things in the future. And we, and we have something so secure and so uh, confident that, that our faith is based in. Instead of having to go through a captivity that is physical, we just have to go through the struggles in this life. Instead of having to, I guess, get all the evil, uh, um, evil spiritual leaders out of our midst and things like that, we just have to turn to the Lord. We just have to be faithful to him and wait for him the way he even tells these people to be. And what will God do one day? Well, he's, he might not restore our fortunes on this earth, but will he not glorify all those that are faithful to him and show them off as what it looks like to truly be blessed by him? Yes, he will. And will there be many people that look at that and will long for that and wish they had heard the message or wish they had, wish they had listened to the message of the prophets before? Yeah, that's true. So in some way, Zephaniah is preaching to us. Zephaniah is not prophesying directly to us, but his message or the, God's message through Zephaniah is true for us as well. That if we have evil things and wickedness around us, we need to separate ourselves from that, and we need to return to the Lord. We need to draw close to Him. That God actually cleanses us through Christ and through His blood so that we can worship and praise Him, so that we can actually be a faithful people. And that one day, the roles will be reversed, because as we have humbled ourselves, God has called the humble and the lowly to Himself to exalt them and bring them to glory. So that, that's how we can relate to these people. What I want to do is I just want to get to a few lessons from Zephaniah, and then I want to kind of try to see how we can apply some of these things to our, ourselves a little bit more. So here are some lessons from Zephaniah that I see. First is that we can truly relate. We can't see anything up there on the top. We can truly relate to Judah's problems. Here are Judah's problems. They had idolatry. They had wicked spiritual leadership. They were worshiping God, but worshiping gods, and they were even worshiping man. They were not faithful to the Lord in any way as a nation. They were looking like the nations that are around them. They wanted to look like the nations around them, it seems. They were being greedy and taking advantage of brethren, people they were supposed to consider family, other people that they were supposed to look at and think, you're also part of the people of God. They were complacent. It's, they just showed a, a, a total lack of care and apathy. And they just got lazy. And they trusted in their wealth. That was what was going on in Judah. These are supposed to be God's people. So, my question that we can talk about is, are any of these problems for you today? And maybe you don't want to answer too personally. So, do you see these types of problems around you today? We'll, we'll start there. In what way do you see these problems today? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's a daily thing. It seems like it's, it gets worse every day. Things that are, are terrible in God's sight and in our sight. Uh, those things force those things on everyone. So yeah. 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 We see the wickedness all around us. We see uh, people that 
that maybe, you know, maybe we don't recognize them as spiritual leaders, but they would claim to, to have some sort of spirituality, of, uh, uh, spirituality within them that they are living by, but they're promoting things that are evil and wicked things, maybe even seeking to uh, unknowingly become, I don't know, like gods themselves and be worshipped in some ways. What about within the church? Do, and I'm not asking about this church, uh, so let me just be clear about that. Can we fathom wicked leadership within churches? Is that possible? Yeah. What leads to wicked leadership within churches? Do what? Thirst for power. Yeah. Pride. Yeah. Complacency, right? Yeah. You can get lazy and you're just like, that, that, can, that can take a, a church down a wrong path. So it could be very intentional with like, I want more, the power. It could be just pride. You don't even, I mean, I, I'm not trying to give people that are prideful a pass, but I think sometimes prideful people don't even know why they do what they do and don't even see the, the evil things and the wicked things and how manipulative they can be. Um, and then complacency. Yeah, you just get lazy, lackadaisical. What, what other things do we see here that we struggle with today? Yeah. Yeah. Some people get caught up in their spouse traveling baseball team. <laughs> uh, and some people just get attracted to money and they put that first in their life. You know, we, it's easy for us to say we're not going to worship idols, but in reality, we see sometimes we let that creep in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It doesn't have to be a physical image. It doesn't have to look shiny. It doesn't have to be anything like that. It doesn't have to be anything that anybody else worships as an idol. We can, we can look within ourselves and know what we are, even if we don't bow down and worship, we know what we're worshiping, what we're giving ourselves over to, right? Um, Luke 16 is actually a place where I think Jesus talks about some of this. Luke's, uh, Matthew 6 might be a little bit more of the popular one, but and Luke 16 is actually the parable of the dishonest uh, servant or the dishonest manager, which is a really difficult parable that probably Philip has preached on and and if not, I guess I just kind of put him on the spot where he's going to need to at some point. But um, I don't fully know how to walk through that parable. But when you look down at the application in verse 10, Jesus says, One who is faithful in very little is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in very little is dishonest in much. If then you've not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is in others, who will give you that which is your own? This is the verse that we know and we remember, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God in money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things. They ridiculed him and said to him, You are those who justify yourself before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Isn't that what Zephaniah was dealing with? What was exalted in the sight of men was an abomination to God, so God totally destroyed it. He did away with it. The scary thing about what he says to the Pharisees who were lovers of money is that God knows your hearts. God knows our hearts, and I believe that we know our hearts. We can look within ourselves and we can know what's an idol to us. Am I complacent? Do I have pride? Am I actually trying to be someone that leads people uh, to the Lord, but really I'm trying to get followers myself and I'm, I'm thirsty for power? Am I taking advantage of my brothers and sisters? And, and not that I intend to, but like, you know, they should be able to handle this them, themselves, okay? And then the, the next step after you just kind of think of them as you do your thing, I'll do mine. The next thing is you will start taking advantage of them. Covetousness doesn't just all of a sudden happen. I, th I think it's a process. The more disconnected we feel with the people that we are part of God's family with, the more we will be likely to treat them like they're nothing to us. So th these are problems, and these can be problems, and it's up to us to decide, are we going to be dedicated to the Lord and seek Him while He may be found? Put away the evil things that maybe are in our hearts and maybe just around us. Um, my brother mentioned the country that we're in. We, we might not be able to control all the things in our country, but I tell you what, we can separate ourselves not without, you know, being um, disrespectful and unruly citizens. We can separate ourselves from the evil while living in this world. 
That's what God has always expected. That's what he hoped for with his people one day. Uh, they, they hoped for uh, back in the days of Zephaniah, but they failed. There are a couple of other things that I want, you, I want to mention and point out from uh, Zephaniah. There's two things in Zephaniah that I noticed that, the, that people say that God calls out. So here's one thing that the people say. That God isn't going to do anything. In chapter 1, it says that... Um, Chapter 1, and it's in verse 12. That he's going to search Jerusalem with lamps, and he's going to punish people who are complacent, and the people he's going to punish that are complacent say, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do ill. God's not going to do anything. I mean, he hasn't done anything yet, at least. Why, why should we think he's going to do anything now? That's one thing that people told themselves. That's one thing that people were saying in their hearts or maybe even saying to each other. That's one of the lies that, that they told themselves. Here's another one. is in chapter 2. And this isn't the people of, of God. This is the, the nations that are surrounding them in verse 15. This is the excellent, uh, ex exultant city, excuse me, that lives securely, that said in her heart, I am and there is no one else. What a desolation she has become, a liar for wild beasts. That's another lie. No one can or will judge me. And so that's from chapter 2, verse 15. So here's two lies that Zephaniah addresses. God's not going to do anything. I mean, he's not going to do good, but he's not going to do evil. He's not going to do bad by people. He's not going to destroy and, and punish. And the second lie is, I am. There is no one else. I'm on my own. I'm above any sort of judgment. I'm above any sort of ridicule. ridicule. I'm above authority. I, I know that um, kids don't like to hear anything about authority. Um, I know that's true. I don't think adults, I don't think we like to hear much about authority either, you know? We like to talk about authority when we're in authority, but we don't like to hear about authority as if we're under authority sometimes. So do we have this mentality of the people that were around Judah I am and there's no one else. I'm on my own. I can make my own decisions. Well, you can, but don't take on this attitude of these people acting like they were above God. So here's my question that I have for, for us is what lies do we tell ourselves? Yeah, I got more time. Yeah. When I was growing up, my granddad would always uh, mention, um, like, I don't know why he did this now that I think about it. It's kind of morbid, but he would always mention, like, um, the average age of, of death for a male. I don't know why. I think, I think it was because he was getting older, and he wanted me to be prepared for um, if he passed soon. But he would always mention that. So in my mind, 72 was the number. Now, that was also 15 years ago. I don't know what the number is now. But, like, 72. That was, that was locked in my head. Okay. I mean, I made it to 32. I don't know if I'm going to make it to 42, 52. I mean, I don't know. Why, why should we think that we have more time? Because we're, we're young, yeah. No matter how old you are, you can think you're young, right? I mean, that's true, you know, because most people, you can, you can find someone older than you, you know. Um, what's another lie that we tell ourselves? Yeah. Um, so it, it actually mentions God's love in Zephaniah. In the midst of all the justice, it mentions God's love. I mean, we, we should appreciate and thank God for his grace, for his love, um, but we should not think that he turns a blind eye to sin. Um, now, he might not enact justice in the moment, but sin is punished. Evil is always punished. Even if we haven't seen it punished yet, God has promised that it will be. And you know what he did in the days of Zephaniah, so why should we think that he won't one day when he's promised that he will? There were a few lies that I thought of that um, we could tell ourselves. Also, I'm sorry, I don't even know what time it is right now. Okay. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Um, so in, in 2 Peter, I'll, I'll just mention this, this one. In 2 Peter, Peter mentions that they say, where's the promise of his coming? Since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning. That's in 2 Peter 3. 
that's just a ridiculous lie that people were saying. Like, where's the promise of his coming? Nothing's changed ever since time began. That's obviously not true. Do we for, they, they forgot about many things where, where God stepped in, where God destroyed. They forgot about the flood. They must have forgotten about that. And that's where in 2 Peter 3, Peter says, don't, look over, don't overlook this one fact, that, the Lord, that, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. That he's not slow to fulfill his promise, but he's actually patient, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So maybe the lie that we tell ourselves is actually a, a truth that's been bent sometimes. Like, we have more time. Well, we, we don't know we have more time, but if we do have more time, God wants us to use that more time. God is grace. God is love. God is patient. He's gracious for a purpose and loving for a purpose, and he's patient for a purpose that we would turn to him. We need to be careful about the lies that we tell ourselves. Here, here's the last point that I, I do want to bring up, is that God wants his people to repent. But I, I have four things that I just want to point out that I saw in chapter 3 of Zephaniah. Like, why does God want his people to repent? Well, I think he wants them to repent so they can draw near to him and worship. That, that's a lot of what he talks about in Zephaniah 3. He wants to prepare them to worship him with pure hearts and clean hands. He wants them to repent because he wants there to be a faithful people that are gathered in one place to be God's family, treating each other the way he's always wanted them to be treated, but also to be an example for other people, to draw other people to him. God wants to save and provide for his people. That's why he says that he's going to restore their fortunes before their eyes. That's going to come after this day of judgment, though. God wants people to repent so he can do these things. But then the last thing that I noticed that was a little unique, and I think it's very unique to Zephaniah, is that God wants to rejoice and sing praises. It actually says that he's going to exult over them with loud singing in chapter 3, verse 17. God wants people to repent to give him reason for praise, to give him reason for singing in joyful sounds. And that shouldn't be too shocking because it's actually, oh, there, there's the quote, sorry, I didn't have that up there. It's actually back in Luke 15. I know we didn't read from Luke 15. In Luke 15, with the parable of the lost sheep, so when he says that when he comes home, he gathers together his friends and his neighbors, and he says to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Why did God send Zephaniah with this message? In hopes that some people would repent and turn to him. Because God wants to glory in that. Why does God want us and want people around us to turn to him, to believe in this gospel, to give themselves over to him? Well, it's for their own sake, of course. It's so that they will be able to be a faithful people that are able to praise him and worship him. But, you know, it's also for another reason. It's because it gives God a reason to sing and to cry aloud with joy and to rejoice when the lost are found. So I, I guess our, our purpose changes to where we don't want to just be the people that aren't burning one day. We actually want to draw people closer to God because God will glory in that. And when we feel like we are just being kicked around and, and humbled and lowly and we hate that feeling, just don't forget that one of the things that he says in Zephaniah 3 is that God exalts the humble and the lowly, the lame, the people that are the outcasts. It doesn't feel good to live that way, but that's exactly who we need to be today. We need to be the humble and lowly, maybe even the outcast. And God will raise us up and, and show us off in his glory one day. I hope these things have been helpful. Um, I guess, do we do an actual invitation song or not really? If you do need something from these brethren, I know that they will pray with you and for you. And so I hope that you will do that. Um, I really appreciate this time. And we're going to sing a song. And hopefully uh, you can reflect back on Zephaniah and uh, take a look at another time and see lessons that you can see from it. Thanks. 180. 180. Jesus is